and uh, my national and international audience. This is once again Professor Dr. Zia Ahmed recording a very short video, it's a rather screen recording, in order to facilitate my students of post colonial literature. And today's topic is a poem, A Far Cry from Africa. Uh, this poem is in the syllabi of uh, BSN English in Pakistan, it may be in many other countries as well, and we shall be talking and discussing this poem today. It's written by Derek Walcott. This is an African literature, piece of literature, and that definitely carries the flavor of Africa. In fact, African literature is more post-colonial as compared to any other literature. With this theme, we are required to enter into this poem. The title is Far Cry from Africa. I mean, it's a cry which is not close, which is not near, it is far away, and it's powerful as well in, in another sense, and it's coming from Africa, and it means that oppression is there, and because of that oppression, the cry is coming up. The cry can also be taken in two senses. One may be cry of pain, another may be cry of protest. In both ways, the poem can be seen. So a far cry from Africa. Let's go in. Derek Walcott, first of all, he is a very famous post-colonial writer and is known not only as a teacher but also as a playwright. Uh, Dream on Monkey Mountain is one of the plays written by him and in that drama as well, he portrays the similar skills as he shows here while writing this poem. The post-colonial nature of his text, of his write-ups, can be imagined from the fact that he represents his own people in the presence of the colonization and oppression and the struggle of the people and the dreams of the people, how they want to get rid of all that and how they want to establish their own governments and power and want to gain independence from all that, yet they are unable. This is going to be the similar kind of theme in this poem as well. So that is why he's very much post-colonial writer he is a poet as well, as the poems go to show, and he's a very successful poet and is voicing the opinion of his people and the opinion of the people who do not belong to him. He is an artist as well. I see him an artist in the sense that he is describing everything artistically. I mean, his power of description and narration is very convincing and appealing. He, therefore, on the basis of his writing, was able to win Nobel Prize as well. Uh, he was born in St. Lucia in British West Indies and was having double racial ancestry. I mean, he was having the genes of the white race as well as that of the black race as, on the part of grandparents. And ultimately, he could be called a person who is having both the races inside himself. And therefore, he needs to trace his roots sometime he would like to drag himself towards the white ancestry and sometimes the black one. And so he needs to create an ideal balance, a combination, a kind of perfect combination of both the things in him, in his writing. Uh, these things are quite visible. So the theme of the roots divided, that goes on and on in his writings again and again. And therefore, this is the kind of person we are going to meet and this is the kind of poetry and the poet we are going to have a discussion about. So A Far Cry from Africa, uh, that is the poem and some of the metadata about the poem is that it was published in 1962. This poem uh, is, is published at a time when colonization had receded back into its territories and the offshoots and the you know, the legacies of uh, colonialism were converting themselves into post-colonialism, especially at that time when the world was bipolar, I mean communistic world as well as that of the capitalistic world. At that time, both the worlds were racing uh, for supremacy in the world and were trying to gain superpower or to become the superpower. In such a situation, the poem is written. So it has the backdrop of the powerlessness and powerfulness. It does have the kind of situation in which one party is oppressed and the other party is oppressor. And the, however, the post-colonial nature of the poem gives the opportunity of the raising of protest, maybe only in the so form of soft poetry or maybe in the form of harsh words, but it is there. Some of the cultural tensions can also be talked about uh, because the poet himself has 
two types of genes and the people too when under colonization in and, and because of the impact of colonization when they enter into post-colonial eras at that time they do have the cultural tensions sometimes because of cultural hegemony and sometimes because of their own movements and migrations when they come across different types of cultures uh, the, the African poets definitely when they are post-colonial poets they do talk about and discuss the occupation of their continent and the uh, sources being utilized by the colonial power and the uh, people being made into oppressed people as Fanon would call them, the, the people who are oppressed. Uh, and, and so they have the problem and these problems are discussed in the poetry of this poet as well. The poet uh, becomes the speaker in his poems most of the time. and. Uh, he is having a type of dilemma and that dilemma is also because under the impact of colonization many things are to be done in accordance with the colonization like it's the English language which had supremacy and a superior hand during the colonial era and if a person who is living in post-colonial era and he's also using that English language instead of using his local language that poses a type of problem and that is why it has got the dilemmical situation. However, the poet continues to uh, explore his, the history of different parts of Africa and sometimes the certain Protestant uprising that could be witnessed in Kenya, for example, in the 1950s, that that thing is also referred to in the poem also. The poem is most of the time about local Kikyu tribe uh, and about the Mau Mau fighters as the novel of Chinwa Achebe, Things Fall Apart, is also about the Ibo people, same as the case with this poetry of this poet, that is Derek Walcourt, that Kikyu tribe will be discussed and talked about. Uh, these people had run certain campaigns. Uh, one of the campaigns was at least eight years long campaign against the white settlers. Uh, this was also an effort to save their own country and to become the owner of their own place, of their own homes. That was the kind of struggle against the settlers. So this is the material of the poem. This is the theme of the poem. This is the kind of situation we can meet in the poem. The text of the poem, I have divided it into three parts. The first part is like that. If you pay a little bit of attention, let's talk about this. A wind is ruffling the tiny pelts of Africa. Kick you quick as flies, batten upon the blood streams of the veld. Corpses are scattered through a paradise. Only the warm colonel of Kirian cries waste no compassion on these separate dead statistics justify and scholar sees the salience of colonial policy. What is that to the white child hacked in the bed to savages expendable as Jews? Let's start it line by line. It says that uh, type of wind is blowing and that wind is harsh, that wind is powerful and the earth on which this wind is blowing, that earth is of brown color definitely. It is the African earth or the ground on which it's blowing. And it's a land where Kikyu tribe lives and uh, the, the wind is blowing very fast as the flies go very fast in that sense it's going on. So in a natural way, the land is being referred to and the air of that area is being referred to and the people. So three things are introduced in the very beginning, two lines of the poem, in order to remind us that the poem is about Kikyu people in Africa and the situation of the environment of Africa has also been talked about. Then comes the uh, birds, the, the welt, for example, is uh, the bird which is the African symbol of some holiness that bird is there and that holiness is being decreased in, in in such a way because the people are dying and the birds may also be shown to be dying and they have the corpses spread here and there and so there is nothing only the Kirian worms are there these worms are crying and saying based no compassion on these separate dead that nobody should come and weep for them because they have died these people don't have any importance who have died except definitely if the people are of the the African land they may die and they are not important in the colonial context and that is why the importance of the people of the death of the people is being undermined uh, for example the poet says that statistics justify and scholars seize the salience of colonial policy because if the people have died some people would come forward from the side of the colonial master who would say that this uh, number of the deaths can be justified the reason can be justified as the 
colonial masters have been killing the people and they would say that they have killed some of the local people because they were bad people and they were trying to harm the cause of the good people and that is why they have been killed and so there will be a lot of justification about this but the people are dead and people are suffering they have the blood being shed by them and so in that way the condition is oppressive what is that to the white child act in bed the poet says that if the same situation is talked about the persons who are living in their homes and rooms quite, quite comfortably in their beds they sleep and enjoy the player and the softness and comfort of their home they are not at all concerned about this death so the white master is being accused that he would not be concerned about this death they think that the local are the people who are savages according to edward sabian concept of post colonial theory the binary opposition goes to suggest that if somebody is good and other people are bad the people local are being declared as to be the savages so it means that other people are civilized and here is the very bitter irony of the post colonial nature that the people who are being killed they are being killed because they are thought to be savages so their deaths don't have any value their number of deaths don't have any value white men if it are, it all dies then definitely they have the value uh expendable as jews so in that way the jews are being referred to as it happened in the second world war that there was a kind of death spread on the jews because christian people thought the jews are not that important same was the case of the dealing of white men with the savages of africa that they dealt him in such a way as they would deal with the jewish people so very uh, bitter and very ironic situation is developed by the poet that the deaths of the people of africa uh, and and the destruction of the land and the and, and the environment of africa does not count much for the white man the white man would take it only as important as he would take a jew in the second world war and the deaths of these jews were not that important for them they just wanted to do this thing same as the case here so in this way the property the the life and the body of the Uh, of the colonized land of the people that is not having having any significance or importance for the people who were their rulers or who were the colonizers so that is the lament that is the protest and that is the kind of point where the poem becomes a post colonial text part two of the poem may be of the same nature let's see thrashed out by beaters the long rushes break in a white dust of ibises whose cries have wheeled since civilization down from the parched river or beast steaming plain and uh, so the poet is talking about the things which are bitten up and things which are kill being killed and destroyed the plants for example the flowers for example and the civilization for example everything has been happening in this world he says it's not a new thing but the thing which is happening this time according to him that is something difficult that is something different that has caused the problem the violence of the beast on beast is read as natural law but upright man seeks his divinity by inflicting pain the violence is spreading everywhere according to the poet and this uh, as the animals would beat each other would kill each other in the same way right now the things are happening that human beings are killing each other and that thing as in the world of animal is said natural and so the upright man the man which is honest man which is good that person has to uh, seek the help of divinity by inflicting pain upon himself without inflicting pain it cannot happen this is the christian uh divine uh, divinity law for example or it's a kind of tradition with them that if you need to make your god happy you need to inflict pain on your body and that is why this pain is being described here that if you need to have your yourself listened you need to inflict the pain so people are inflicting pains upon them as well delirious as these worried beast his wars dance to the titan carcass of a drum So this thing is happening everywhere not only the world of animals but also in the world of the human being the people are dancing they are dancing uh, because of the drum which is made up out of the carcass of certain animal of the skin of certain animals so it's being bitten it means that in order to dance in order to make this thing known also one needs to have a drum and this drum cannot be prepared until until unless an animal is killed and the skin is used so in the same way somebody had to be killed somebody had to suffer even if the voice is to be raised so the colonized people have to suffer they have to be killed they they need to inflict pain upon themselves only then they can be heard otherwise nobody will be listening to them so a very bitter irony very bitter satirical situation is being talked about by the poet in order to make the people realize how much the life of the colonized people could be difficult 
while he calls courage still that native dread of the white peace contracted by the dead so that's the kind of situation in which white man is present the local people are present white man is the oppressor and the local people are the oppressed people so everything on the part of the oppressed people even if it may be courageous may be taken as a negative but on the part of uh, a white man if the same thing is there that will be taken as the courage so all good is assigned to the white man and all bad is assigned to the local oppressed person part three of the poem again brutish necessity wipes its hands upon the napkin of a dirty cause again a waste of our compassion as with spain the gorilla wrestles with the superman i who am poisoned with the blood of both where shall i turn divided to the vein first four lines first uh, the poet says that uh, after the fight the hands are to be wiped out on certain napkin and uh, that napkin becomes dirty because of the cause the cause to be served the cause of freedom to be served and in that way it was the waste of compassion because if the same thing had been happening in spain as well the gorilla people and the superman people fought with the other people but he says that it's the uh, very difficult for him to to praise or to admire someone one side the two sides he says he has to talk about because the person who is killing also belongs to him and the person who's killed also belongs to him in that way it is very difficult for him to decide or part with one side so in that way dilemma of the poet comes forward once again in the end of the poem that he belongs to the white people as well and then he belongs to the colonized african as well and according to him it's very much difficult for him to divide the vein or to become the part of one poetry he says that he is the blood with the blood of the both uh, he seems that him feeling poisoned is there uh, because of this situation has become very critical for the poet so therefore he is with the people who are oppressed but then he has not to say anything bad to the people who are the oppressors that is the situation of every colonized person every post colonial person that he has to represent his people also and then he has to imitate the masters as well in that situation people keep on working and this very thing is called as the post colonial theory part 4 of the poem says i who have cursed the drunken officers of british rule how choose between this africa and the english tongue i love again dilemma is there according to him he has been talking about certain people of a, a white uh, group who are the rulers he says that it's very difficult for him to choose between these two things for example he wants to love his people but then he has to write in english language in that way he becomes english as well he remains he wants to remain africa but then he becomes english as well so in that way both the things are going side by side and he puts a question here here how he can side with one party for example betray them both or give back what they give so either the choice is that he should betray both the people i mean white and the black people or he should try to give everything back and become one person how can he face such slaughter and be cool again dilemma is being questioned that either he should stop and look at the people who are being slaughtered and feel good but he says how can he do that it's not possible for him so he have to speak that as well it means that he wants to talk about the oppression but he cannot in that forceful way talk about the oppressor and so that is the postmodernial situation of every postmodernial subject and then he says the last question how can i turn from africa and live and that shows the patriotism the love the nationalism for africa he says that he cannot go away from africa he cannot side with other people so that is why he has to stay with african people and if if he goes away then his own life finishes his own identity finishes his own connection with the people finishes so according to him he has to stay with them so that's the type of poem that is suggestive of so many things which are most relevant to post colonial theory which are making the poet as post colonial poet because he has to not only represent his people but also has to talk about the master who is definitely a colonial master the colonial master may be doing certain bad things to his people and the people because of their being colonized have to tolerate all that so that's the situation portrayed in the poem a far cry from africa this poem has got three stanzas first stanza is of 10 lines second of 11 lines and then comes the third one which is of 12 lines now there is no regularity in the stanza form so we cannot say that the stanzas are in particular form only parts of the poem have been made for the sake of understanding first part is of 10 lines second of 11 and then it is of the 12 and then is the rhyme scheme of the poems very casual very 
un or irregular kind of rhyme scheme. It's erratic all the time. For example, if you look at the colored words, they do have the sounds like that, which are the similar sounds, but then the next lines do not show the similar pattern. So somewhere here and there, some rhyming has been followed. Most of the time it has not been followed. For example, in stanza one, we have fly strides, dead bed, or pelt felt, but in the second, we go and find out plain pain and dread dead. So the third one again goes to show again Spain vein. So a type of rhyme scheme is there, but not the regular one. There's rhythm in the poem also because the meter, the iambic pentameter, I mean, five meters are available in the free verse. Uh, for example, a wind is ruffling, ruffling the taw and the pelt. So in that way, syllables and iams or the NFS are being talked about. Five, five or oh, pentameter style has been used in the second line, third one as well. Uh, there is uh, less consistency of the line and length of the poem. Sometime there, there could be 10 syllables in order to make the five meters whatever the case may be one can very easily say that iambic pentameter has been followed in this poem so that is stylistic analysis and it comes uh, critical points as well in the poem are available for example some of the poetic dresses have been used in the poem uh, first one is alliteration that's the repetition of the consonant sounds like it is beaten upon the bloodstream so bar sound tar sound is being repeated colonel of carrion cries so again ka sound being repeated then it comes the scholar sees, sa sound, betray them both, the ba sound is being repeated. So in that way, there's a lot of alliteration in the poem also. Then comes resonance. I mean, the wall sounds being repeated, warm colonel. So o sound, white child, i sound, white vices, cries. Again, i sound, b steaming, again, e sound is there. There are certain other repetitions as well, like waste cries, beast white again. Repetition of words is there. Some of the meanings are repeated. Some of the words are repeated in order to give a lot of enforcement to the lines and the words. When we conclude the poem, we can say that the poem represents poet's dilemma, whether he belongs to the colonized people or to the colonial people. He has the genes of both one, and he has to live with that because of his identity in that way. Then the poem is post-colonial because not only the empire is writing back, but also the empire itself is writing and is being written about. This bad experience of the people, very bad experience of the people have been talked about. Some of the resolutions are there. I mean, after bad experiences, the resolutions of the people are there, as is the revolution of every colonized person. Some of the desires of the natives have also been talked about. The native would desire to get freedom and to sleep with the master's wife. I mean, uh, there's a kind of wish to, to play back in the same way as the colonial master played to them. Now the colonized people want to do the same. Suppression and oppression go hand in hand in the poem. A lot of oppression has been talked about. Racialism is also there because both the people have different divided worlds and the same thing poet is talking about. Some of the power dynamics have been talked about. The powerful would be powerful all the time and the powerless would be powerless, but the struggle continues to be there. The powerless all the time tries to become powerful, but his efforts mostly fail. However, sometimes the efforts succeed and that is why the revolutions come and post colonial theory takes place. So in this way, this is the poem of the today. So in that way, dear uh, viewers, you have seen that the poem has been talked about in many ways. Line by line discussion has also been talked about. It has shown about the African people and the writer as well. So in this way, the poem, which is a far cry from America by Valk, or that is being closed here. So that was all about this poem. Hopefully you will like it. And when you find something good about the lecture, do not hesitate to hit the subscribe button and to write some comment so that I may also read the responses of the people. So that's it from me for this day. Hope to meet you in some next coming video. Till then, bye-bye.